Okay, so now they want us to actually conduct that test. So we know that we can because we verified the, all three requirements. Just for the record, by the way, don't verify requirements unless you're asked to. If you're not asked to, just assume that the requirements are met. So only verify them when required, say for a project or for a problem on the test or for a problem in your notes or worksheets or whatever. But the rest of the time, if it doesn't ask you to do it, then just don't bother. Okay, so at the 0.05 level significance, that's interesting. Um, is there enough evidence to conclude that the state quarters um, have a mass different, there's another interesting point, than 5.72 grams? So I highlighted those two words because they're going to help us figure out parts one and two. So the first thing we want to notice is that we're talking about having a mass different than 5.72 grams. That's not a proportion problem. That's going to be a mean problem. And we also know that alpha is 0.05. Everybody's favorite step is step two, because it's always the step that's given. So you have to write H0 and H1. You're talking about the mean, mu. So the population mean is assumed to be 5.72, because that's what the state or the US Mint said it was. And then we will see if we can prove otherwise. We will see if we can prove that it's different than 5.72, within a certain level of confidence or level of significance, I should say. All right, now if I go back to the test, so I've done steps one and two, created my null and alternative. The not equal to, I forgot to mention, happened because of the word different. Different is a not equal to problem. So now I'm on the test statistic. I need t0, which is x bar minus mu zero over s over the square root of n. All right, so I'm going to have to put in all those values into my calculator in order to come up with these because I'm going to need x bar uh, and s in particular. I know what n is. n is the square root of, or n is 18. So the square root of n is the square root of 18. But I'm going to need all the rest of it. There. Now I have them, but I got them by magic. So you might be wondering, where did I get those from? And the answer is, there's two ways you can get it. But you have to go back here and you have to take these data points and you have to type them into the calculator. So you go to stat, go to edit, clear, go up and press clear, enter, clear out your old data, and then I'm actually going to um, change my display here so that we can see the data points at the same time. So I'm going to have to type in all those data points. So 5.70, 5.65, 5.67, 5.79, and so on. All right, I'm going to go type all these in. I'll be right back. All right, there they are. They're all typed in. At least I think I typed them all correctly. Okay, so now let me go back to showing the large display for you all. And then I want you to see that there's two ways you can do this. Now, you'll know how to find this because on your exam note packet at the very top, right there in the little gray box, I tell you that this is a t-test. So when you go to your calculator, you can go to stat, you can go to tests, and you can run number two, which is a t-test. And you can tell it data this time because all the data are sitting in list one. Mu was 5.72, that's mu zero. Zero is from the zero, the null hypothesis. And your list is L1. Always leave frequency list as one. We're doing a not equal to because it's a different. And then go down to calculate and press enter. And there you have it, just like that. And notice it tells you X bar is 5.702. S X is 0 0.04965, and the T, and that's T0, that's negative 1.519. That's your test statistic. So that is where I got all my values from. I ran the t-test, and when I ran the t-test, it tells me my X bar, my S, and my test statistic. It also tells me N, but I knew N anyway, it was 18. The only thing I don't know automatically is mu zero, but that comes from my zero hypothesis, 5.72. It's the value of mu that I assume to be true unless I can prove otherwise. Neat, huh? So let me show you a couple other features. So if I go to stat, tests, and pick number two, t-test, with a value like 1.519, I can actually draw this. 
Let me see what my window's at. So I selected draw instead of calculate, and it'll be slow, but it'll get the job done. There, you can see that the calculator is drawing the graph for step four for us for a p-value method. Now the only danger with this, and there is a big danger, so don't get too reliant on this. The thing is that the calculator is only really good at showing anywhere from a test statistic of, you know, zero up to about two, maybe three. And at three, it's so far over, the tail is so tiny, it's not going to do a good job of showing you a graph. So it'll look like it's not graphing anything. It is, but you can't really see it. So we're limited in the scale here. But that's another nice little feature, is the draw feature in tests. And of course, if you wanted to, you could have run one variable stat, the old standby, to find the X bar and the S as well. And when you run it, there it is, 5.702 and S is 0.04965, etc. So one way or another, you're going to get those values. And you also just got the graph and what it looks like. But you can also see it right in your exam notes packet. There we have it, it's being fluky. So it's this part right here. You're doing the p-value method. So you're looking at the picture on the right, and that's the picture the calculator's drawing. It's in particular, you're looking at the two-tailed picture, where you have the negative t0 and the positive t0. That's because the left-hand one has to be the negative 1.519, and the positive one, 0.519, has to be on the right. And just note, the p-value there is automatically figured out for both sides. There's little arrows, and you have to draw the double arrow, and it goes to both of them. So when I draw it on my paper, I have it so that the p-value of 0.147 is a double-sided arrow that's going to both the left tail and the right tail. The p-value is the two gray areas together. It's not the left the, or nor the right on their own. It's both of them. And the calculator figured that out for us. So you draw it like that. And then you have to make a decision. Well, you only reject the p-value methods nice and easy. You reject H0 if your p-value is low. You remember, we always want low p-values. The probability of a fluke should be low. The lower, the better. Well, our probability is not that low. Our probability is 0.1471. So that's not that low at all. So we are going to not reject the null hypothesis. Our p-value is simply not low enough for us. And what I like to do when I write this, I write do not reject H0, first of all. Always say which, what you're not rejecting, which is the null, always the null hypothesis, always and then write y, and it's in this case because the p-value, which was 0.1471, is not less than alpha. So I have a little slash through my less than. I wanted less than alpha, and I didn't get it. All right, now we have to remind ourselves how to write the conclusion. Well, in section 10.1, we learned that when we did not reject the null hypothesis, there is not enough evidence to support the claim that was made in the alternative hypothesis. The alternative is always what our claim is. So we write, there is not enough evidence to support the claim that the new state quarters have a different mass than the old state quarters. This beginning part is kind of set in stone. There's not enough evidence to support the claim. It's this part back here where we have to kind of describe what the alternative hypothesis was in our case. That's where the real work on this part is to give it context and make sure it makes sense. All right, so now we have to do the next part, which is when we have to redo just steps four and five with the classical method. Now, I'm just going to have you do steps four and five because, of course, I could make you do the whole thing with the classical method if I so desired. But steps one, two, three, and six should all be the same. Heck, even step five decisions should be the same because the decision we made was not dependent upon the method. So it should work out to be the same. It's just that our reasoning and our graph for steps four and five would be different. So steps one, two, and three classical method would be identical. So all I'd have to do is step four of the classical method. So let me scroll on to the left over here. In the classical method, we would need to find the two-tailed picture 
we need to find critical values, negative t alpha over 2 and positive t alpha over 2. And then we're going to compare the, our test statistic, t0, which we found in step 3, to those values. Okay, so we start off with step 4, we need alpha over 2. But we know alpha from step 2 up here is 0.05. So we just take alpha and we cut it in half, that gets us 0.025. Then we also know our degrees of freedom is n minus 1, and n was 18, so that gives us 17. So our critical values are inverse t, 0 0.025 comma 17, which let me prove to you what I did was correct. So let me go to the distribution menu, number 4, inverse t, 0 0.025, 17, paste, enter. And there you go, 2.110. It's also, by the way, in the T table, if I scroll back to it. There, you look at the 0.025 column, and you'd scroll down to 17, and there it is, 2.110. Okay, so that's my, those are my critical values, so I draw them. And you should be labeling them accurately. Notice these are further out than they were before. These two vertical lines are at negative 1.519 and positive 1.519. Technically, this is the negative absolute value of t0 on the left, the positive absolute value of t0 on the right. t0, t0, which is the value of the test statistic given that the zero hypothesis is true. All right, then this is t alpha over 2, so that's 2.110, so they're farther out. So I have those vertical lines farther out. They're actually drawn to scale here. And I have each of these tails labeled with the alpha over 2, and I have them labeled with the number that they are as well, which is 0 0.025, in order to get full credit. You have to do all of that. Every little bit of that picture needs to be drawn. Then I put a little vertical line just for our own benefit to show where negative 1.519 would be. So our test statistic is at negative 1.519, just with just a touch after halfway, uh, one and a half, excuse me, one and a half standard errors away. So that's not far enough. You need to be in the tails. You need to be something rare to reject. So it look if you look at the table, oops, I gotta go back to it. You wanna look at the two-tailed. And it says, reject the null hypothesis if your test statistic t0, that's from step 3, which in our case is negative 1.519, is less than negative t alpha over 2, or greater than positive t alpha over 2. In other words, if it's in the tails. It's called the rejection region or the critical region. And our value is not in the critical region. So that's what we're going to say. We are going to not reject the null hypothesis because our test statistic is not in the critical region. There. Now the mathy way to say that is that t0, which was negative 1.519, is between, sorry, I forgot to write that, negative 1.519, is between negative 2.110 and positive 2.110. In other words, it was not in either of the critical regions. There's two of them. There's one on the left and there's one on the right, and it wasn't in either one of those. It was between those critical values which were plus or minus t alpha over 2. There we have it. And you should write either all of this or write out the formal mathematical phrase for it, whichever way makes more sense to you.